Sir, how are you? Ah, fine, Alhamdulillah. Sir, the recording channel is not only door can Right. Sir, I'll get you to be put it on Okay, the idea of polarization is actually pretty simple. The amount of math that is that we have from the idea of polarization is also really small. We just have to know uh, the idea for what it is and how it is helpful. More actual usage of the polarization idea will come into the A2 syllabus when we talk about the communication process for digital communication and such. So that will be come that will come later in the A2. So currently we're just having a very introduction for the idea of polarization. And we're gonna see some parts about it. The picture that you can see over here is actually the very starting idea for the idea of polarization. One of the thing is that light is a transverse wave. So whenever <coughs> any the way we define a transverse wave. Uh, whenever we involve a physical medium, it's easier to visualize that way other than the electromagnetic waves directly, is that when the particle movement of a certain wave is perpendicular to the direction of the energy transfer. So if a wave is going this way, let's say if a wave is going from left to right, if the particles which are responsible for the movement of this wave, they move perpendicular to the direction of the wave's energy. So if there is an anti degree angle, so this is the particle or orientation, vibration orientation, this is the wave orientation. In that case, this is the type of wave that we call transverse wave. Now, in, the interesting part is that this particle vibration orientation needs to be 90 degree with the wave direction. This can lead to a lot of different options. For example, if I draw this picture, uh while looking at this from here so let's say if i'm looking at this wave from this part let's this is the eye so the wave is coming towards the observer so if i draw that image over here let's say this dot over here represents the incoming wave towards us towards me towards you and uh, so the source is behind the screen the wave is coming out of the page in that case this wave can be a transverse wave having its particles vibrating this way. So the particles can vibrate this way. So where there will be 90 degree between the wave and the part the wave direction. The particles can also vibrate this way. The particles can vibrate this way. The particle can vibrate this way. The particle, to be honest, can vibrate in a perpendicular plane. If I draw it right somewhere over here, within any in any orientation within this perpendicular plane. So uh non-polarized or unpolarized uh, wave is something that has a combination of multiple waves where the or where the vibration of the particles could be in all possible planes which is possible to be there so the vibration of the particles is not limited to one specific alignment there is a possibility of multiple alignments this is the typical 
a physical idea for how the polarization, uh, wh what the idea of an unpolarized wave is. For electromagnetic wave, it is a bit uh, complicated to uh, draw uh, manually and also to visualize a bit as well. Because one of the things for electromagnetic wave is that the way electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves travel is that they produce series of electric fields and magnetic fields. For example, if the electric field is laying on the screen surface, then the magnetic fields would be laying on the per on a uh, perpendicular surface of the screen and the magnetic waves would be somewhat flat of this shape. It's not very uh, easy to understand unless I give you a bit of a shade. For example, if I draw the electromagnetic waves uh, displacements by vertical arrows, vertical shades, and maybe the magnetic field lines by the idea of a bit of flat surface. This is a three-dimensional uh, proposition uh, within a two-dimensional plane. So this figure might be a bit difficult for you to understand, but that's pretty much how electromagnetic wave travels from one place to another place. It has alternative electric and magnetic field placed perpendicular to each other. So whenever we say that a certain electromagnetic wave, for example, light wave is unpolarized, that would actually mean that within that flow of wave, within that flow of energy of wave, within that propagation of energy, we have all of these, uh, we have multiple different waves where each of their individual orientation of electric field and magnetic field can be in multiple different orientation. For one specific wave, its own electric field and its own magnetic field, they would always be 90 degree. But for different waves, all of the electric field and magnetic field orientation can be somewhat different. So drawing both of these waves simultaneously for to represent a uh, an unpolarized wave for electromagnetic wave is actually pretty difficult. That's why in many cases we don't do that. So for example, on the figure that we have over here, it is showing us that the light wave is coming out of a bare source. So without any filtering, as the source gives out our light, this light coming out can have its vibration orientation or the perpendicular to the wave perpendicular plane could be in any possible case. So this is a way, this is a, a representation mechanism that we use to represent unpolarized light sources. So arrows that is aimed in a lot of different directions. So it can be drawn like this. It can be also drawn like this. Basically multiple different arrows uh, in multiple different orientation is basically what shows an unpolarized light. The reason we can have- What is the polarizing filter? Uh, polarizing filter oh, the reason light rays uh, come out to be unpolarized or there is no specific uh, discipline for within which plane these light rays will, should actually vibrate is because whenever we have a vivid light source for example uh, the flame of a candle or the filament of a light bulb or maybe the led so an led light source where the electrons are jumping through the small tiny barrier is that the excitation, the, the de excitation of the electrons which are responsible to produce the electromagnetic wave, they can have that emission of electromagnetic wave from different, having different type of movement in different places of the uh, object, of the whole object. So that's why unpolarized axis can have so many different uh, orientation. Now, what a polarizing filter does, it has some, what can I say, atomic level filter, or they have some atomic level barrier, which will only allow a very specific alignment of light to pass through, and all the other lights will be cut off. Now, there is a uh, way that I can physically explain this thing, for example, something of this sort. Let's say uh, we have, uh, let's say we have a hose pipe of water. So try to understand this example. So we have a hose pipe of water that is streaming out a cylindrical shape of water out of, a, out of this thing. So let's say this is the water cylinder from the face. So this is, this is the cross-sectional of the water that is coming out of a hose pipe. 
without any break. So it's uh, like a faucet water coming out. Now, if you have a uh, slicer uh, liquids, um, okay, let me just show, show you. If you have a barrier, or let's say you have a piece of plastic, let's say you have a piece of plastic and that has multiple different slits within it, it within it let's say they have this shape okay so if we place this barrier onto the path of the water let's say we're going to take this and we're going to place it onto the water path so what's going to happen through these gaps the water will come out but water will not be coming out through the blocked part so the if we place a barrier over here with a very specific structural design, let's say we have now vertical openings over here, uh, it is possible that the water that will coming out from here, they will all be vertical slashes of, or of, of water paths. I mean, it's very difficult. It might be difficult for you to visualize because we don't have that kind of uh, devices for our purposes, uh, for our, our regular life. But one common example that I can give you is that if you consider the example for showers, uh, shower heads have multiple different tiny holes in their shower head. And uh, when the water comes out from the pipe, the water comes out as a continuous stream. But because the opening has this many small holes, the water comes out in droplet format. That's what gives us the whole uh, shower thing. So this physical uh, barriers presence actually changes the way the water comes out through this path. Polarization is something similar of that sort, not exactly same. This is just a visual example that can help you understand better. It's not the exact similar thing, but it's very much similar in, in, uh, in terms of the uh, output that we have in the process of polarization. In the process of polarization, we have some uh, polarizing filters. The polarizing filters are actually, um, I shouldn't say a microscope, but they are basically atomic level uh, slits. So for example, if this is a polarizing filter, this is manufactured in a very special way. It's not, it's not uh, scratched like a diffraction grating. The diffraction grating that we discussed earlier that we have a simple piece of glass, like a regular piece of glass, that was scratched at multiple different vertical lines very, very carefully to give us very thin slits or transparent places through which the light can come out. A polarizing filter is not that type. It is manufactured in such a way, layer after layer, so that it has multiple different gaps to itself. One common example that I can help you uh, give uh, so that you understand how this actually is at atomic level, if you come to think about the uh, atomic structure of graphite. The way atomic structure of graphite works is that we have all the hexagonal layers. Did you guys, guys come across the sigma layer and sigma bond and pi bond? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So if you consider the structure for a graphite, within the graphite, you have the sigma layer, which is the hexagonal net structure uh, stacked one upon another. And all those sigma layers are actually connected to each other by pi, layer, pi bonds. So if you, let's say, if you consider this structure, so this entire uh, atom presence is actually sort of like a barrier and the gap of the pi bond over here is sort of like an uh, opening. So if you send some light beam uh, through a piece of graphite over here, it is possible that all the light photons or all the light waves, which are gonna hit onto the sigma barrier, they're gonna get absorbed over here and the parts which are going to pass through, they can simply pass out through that graphite piece. I'm not talking about the graphite will be used for a. Uh, I'm not saying that graphite can be used for uh, for, a, for, a, for a, a polarizing filter, but it is the atomic structure of graphite that you know that is somewhat similar to what actually happens for the atomic structure of the polarizing filters. Just a second. Sorry. So, uh, so the way polarizing filters work is that if we send unpolarized light through a polarizing filter, it will uh, allow exclusively, ex exclusively the waves which are making their vibration passing through that gap. Uh, 
another example that I can give you to make sense of how does a physical polarization can work. Uh, this example would be a bit rugged or it, it will not be a very, very, uh, very, uh, it will be an approximate idea. For example, let's say here you have a pole with which you have a piece of rope that is, uh, uh, that is uh, tied with it. And let's say this is the rope and it goes by over here and here is your hand. So let's say this is your hand. I'm gonna write hand. Other than drawing it, so let's this your hand, and you can vibrate this string uh, in any orientation you like. So you can vibrate it up and down, left and right, diagonally, whatsoever. So let's say uh, within this rope structure, uh, before before uh, I mean, let's say if we have a piece of cardboard that has a vertical slit right through here, one vertical slit right through here, through which the uh, string has to pass through. So I'm going to erase a small part of this thing. Let's say I'm going to erase this part. So if you consider, let's say this is a vertical slit to, uh, uh, that the light rays has to pass through. What happened? Why did I lose the thickness? Okay. So let's say now the string is passing like this. Now, what I need to understand, as long as I keep the slit vertically open, if you make a vibration of your hand, vertically up and down that is going to produce waves like this that is perfectly aligned with this hole this wave can actually pass through this slit along with the string unobstructed that's going to happen the strings particle can still do their vibration through this slit and the wave can pass through however that will not be the case if you start to vibrate this string horizontally left and right like that so if you start to move this side left and right, what's going to happen is that the wave is going to travel like this through the rope all the way up to this barrier. But the moment it reaches onto this open slit, this rope medium is going to start to collide with the two uh, left and right edge of the slit. And the energy is going to get starting to get absorbed within this barrier. And as a result, uh, energy cannot pass through to the uh, next part you might wonder a little bit of energy can pass through yes that's true actually for a physical example a small amount of energy will definitely pass through. I mean, you can still see a little bit of vibration over here that's the case for a physical example for a rope i say that this is a rugged example uh but uh not all the energy can pass through but whether as if you would vibrate it vertically you can have a lot of energy pass through so this is also another uh, representation for how polarization work so the definition of polarization goes like this let me just show you Okay, polarization, also polarization, <coughs> ZRS, is a property at applying to transverse waves that specifies geometrical orientation of the oscillations. In a transverse wave, the direction of the oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of the wave, the uh, direction of motion of the wave. A simple example of polarized transverse wave is a vibrating along a taut string, C image. So this is actually one of those images where we have a bit of a vibration. Is this a string, sir? Hmm? Is this a yeah. string? This is a certain string where it was a circular wave. You don't have to bother about circular wave. They are coming up with the example for a circular polarization as well because polarization can also be circular, uh, but not so much important for your level. The idea for polarization is that the way we can make an unpolarized light into a polarized light. And how do we, how do we define polarized light? A polarized light is, uh, or a polarized wave is a wave within which the vibration of the medium particles are specifically defined to vibrate in one single plane, not in all possible alternative, alternately possible planes. So you have only one specific alignment of the vibration and that basically does the, uh, that's what we call a uh, polarized wave. So a polarizer basically helps us to filter out or cut off certain part of the wave that we do not want. There are many, many uh, amazing uses of a polarizer, a polarizer mechanism. One of the very common uses is to avoid glare. Do you guys know what this thing is? No, sir. Uh, glare okay, is... Okay. Sir, the angry look. Boss, sir. Uh... Glaring at someone. 
is that a clear chin glare? Okay, that might be a glare also. Glaring look, glare. Hold up. Okay, I'll put it as stare in an angry face. Okay. Okay, I meant this one. Strong and dazzling light. Strong and dazzling light. Sir, I want to say Photoshop is sir. When I do it, sun erect the it had to like intensity common of irishita, sir. Precisely. So glare is basically an uh, uh, too much light that will help that will uh, obstruct your vision of the intended object. Too much light that obstructs the vision of the intended object. A very common example for glare is that let's say you're playing cricket on a sunny day, a catch goes up, but you cannot you miss the catch because the sun was in your eye or the ball was falling while you are exactly looking at the sun. So you cannot see the ball. It's not that there is shortage of light. There's just too much light that you cannot detect the position of the ball as it is coming towards you. So you miss the catch. So that's something of an example for a glare. Yes, sir, we use this polarization in sunglasses, sir. Yes, we use this. Uh, we use this for better vision in a lot of cases, actually. Polarization, uh, but sunglasses are a very common use. And also uh, in cases wherever the extra, the extra light might actually produce a difficulty of vision we go for this mechanism for example the helmets of MotoGP drivers or SBK drivers or even formula one drivers they have a colorful rainbow type uh, coating if you have seen this thing let me just show so you this sunglasses uh, radar blue circular exactly exactly it's a drunken type. those uh MotoGP helmet uh, Sir, 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 blue or red, sir, filter, uh, filter, sir, I mean, I sir. I mean, I had seen my polarization tackle should be there. I give you that I had So, what happens is that uh, on a very sunny day, you can have what is called mirage. Mirage is basically you might have seen that on a very hot day, uh, things in front of you might seem to vibrate because of the uh, uh, convection current of the hot air rising up and they have a different density for the different layers so and this is also visible for an open bonfire if you look up above the above open bonfire the images behind they seem to vibrate or shake is because the light undergoes different random angle of, uh, of refraction so this can actually lead to a significant problem for high speed racing. So they use those glaring, uh, use those uh, polarizing uh, goggles or polarizing face shield so that they can cut off the extra light and exclusively allow you to see exactly what you want to see. One of the very common use for polarizing sunglasses uh, is also can be used for fishing. Uh, this is because uh, water has a property that whenever unpolarized light falls on it, this is just a property of water. Uh, whenever unpolarized light falls on it, let's say unpolarized light is of this type that it is coming onto the water, <clears throat> the light that reflects off becomes horizontally polarized and the light that goes refract into the water, water surface, that becomes vertically polarized. The water does this thing. Now, why does the water does this thing? How does the water does this thing? I'm not going to go in going into this detail. For the time being, just take my word that water does this kind of change to this thing. So, if so, this is why so, sir, polarization it, is also refraction. Uh, polarization is not refraction. Refraction is the change of speed related to the change of angle. <laughs> polarization is limiting the vibration in a very specific plane. For example, uh, the way water works is that it exclusively reflects the horizontal lights uh, of the surface and it exclusively allows the vertically polarized light to itself. All the other light rays get absor absorbed. That's how water behaves. So polarization is not uh, refraction or reflection. I'm telling you that what happens to the uh, in, in terms of uh, considering polarizing uh, properties, how does the water behave for different type of polarizing object? So interestingly, whenever uh, this refracted light actually falls onto anything that you want to see under the water, for example, if, let's say there is a fish over here, a pretty beautiful fish, and you want to see it from above, uh, white light, uh, the vertically polarized light will eventually come up and eventually reflect off. This light that is coming off from the bottom of the water surface will remain vertically polarized even when it enters the air. 
but the water that will be reflected off this point. For example, I am showing you one pair of one, one light ray that is actually falling onto this part and initially getting reflected off the fish and coming out over here. You should understand that whenever a certain water surface is illuminated from the source, light will also fall onto this point as well. So light is falling everywhere onto the water surface. So from the part where the reflected right light ray of the from under the water is coming off, you can think uh, in this in those points we would also have basic reflection of the other light rays as well. So which is which are going to give us horizontal light rays. The problem that happens that this horizontal light rays will help us to see the reflection of the sun into the sky in the sky. And this vertical light rays will help us to see the fish underneath the water. So what do we want to see? Depending upon that, we can choose the orientation of the sunglasses or <coughs> fishing glasses. There's sometimes they're called that as well. So if you use a vertically polarized sunglass, for example, there is a vertically polarizing sunglass and the eye is behind it, you say this is your eye. And what happens is that whenever the light rays are gonna pass through this thing, the horizontally polarized light rays, which are coming off the reflection, basically showing you the sun, they are gonna be completely cut off. You're not going to see any reflection of the sky or the clouds or the sun whatsoever. You're gonna see a very clear image of what is underneath the water. Can help you for fishing, looking for mines or minerals or whatever it is that you are trying to do. Or trying to look for mermaids, if you, are, if you believe in this kind of things, that makes it easy. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> So that's one common use for polarizing glass. I'm going to show you one view for the polarizing glass. But before I get into that, sir, uh, if videos, you consider the, I mean, the horizontal light rays, so that we see the verti verticals okay. only, exactly. Okay, sir. Uh, one question, sir. <laughs> what? When the sun rays and the clouds, they aren't they supposed to have both vertical and horizontal, sir? Yeah, the unpolarized light have light rays uh, have uh, light rays uh, which are vibrating in all directions. And in within unpolarized light, you have horizontal, vertical, angular, diagonal in all directions. Uh, and whenever you have a very specifically polarized light ray, you have a very specific uh, amount of it. So for in sunglasses, we have the ones that can filter out the horizontal one. The orientation that you're going to apply to the polarizer, that polarizer will allow exclusively that orientation. So if you have a vertical polarizer, that will allow only vertical light. If you have a horizontal polarizer, that will allow only horizontal light, so on and so forth. I mean, sir, what is the benefit uh, we can get from this fishing part? I maybe I got a bit lost over here. Right? People who do fishing, they find it they find it beneficial to have a look at the fishes underneath the water. I mean, uh, sir. I mean, sir. Over here, you said that the water fills, filters out the horizontal uh, polarized light. So, what? How? How can our polarization? I mean, fishing sunglasses help us over here. They help to see what are the objects underneath the water surface without by cutting off the glare of the reflection of the surface. So it's gonna cut off the reflection from the surface, only allow you to see the light rays coming under the water surface. That way you can be more clearly seeing, uh, not having that. It's something of a similar similar example that I can say, for example, let's say if you're trying to, um, uh, let's say talk to your friend across your classroom in a noisy classroom, it's difficult to communicate. But <laughs> if, if, if all the sound is off, then it's easier to communicate, something like that. If you have too much light coming up from different sources that you don't want to see, uh, information can become lost within the noise. So you're trying to get a very specific, you're trying to see objects underneath the water, for example, let's say. And if you are also delivered with a lot of other light rays that you don't want to uh, see, then it would be difficult for you to detect the object that you're trying to see because our eye has a very uh, specific uh, what can I say, sensitivity towards how much light should it, uh, how much uh, processing it should do, depending on how much light it has. I mean, sir, I got all the, all this part, but here you said that it removes the glare. So, sir, what does the glare has? Like hor the horizontal. horizontal? In this case, horizontal. Horizontal uh, polarized light is what I'm calling the glare. Oh, sir. Okay, sir.
Okay, in your syllabus, we also have the Malasses law. The Malasses law is actually pretty simple. I'm trying to find out a very simple figure to deal with it. I think this will work just fine. Mass law is, law is the only uh, mathematical equation that you have in your syllabus for the polarizing concept. What it tells us, before I get into that, here they have used the term uh, E naught as the sign of electric field, but uh, wait, let's say I'm gonna cross that off. Uh, I'm gonna write all of them as A. I'll tell you why I'm writing them as A because I'm trying to mean amplitude. So one thing you should remember that the intensity of a certain wave is proportional to the amplitude squared. It is also proportional to the frequency squared and it is proportional to the inverse of the distance squared. So these are the three proportionalities that we always work with. Now intensity being proportional to amplitude squared can is actually the part that we're gonna use for Malassis law. The way this figure is working, this is a three dimensional figure representation within a two dimensional plane, the screen. So. Uh, try to understand. Let's say we have an unpolarized light source over here. We have the first polarizer over here, which is currently oriented vertically. So when the light will be made to pass through this path, only the vertically vertical only the vertical alignment light will be allowed to pass through. All the other lights will be cut off. So let's say if the intensity of this light source over here is let's say hundred, uh, the intensity hundred unit. Let's say the intensity over here is hundred unit the intensity over here should be significantly smaller than 100 units because we have cut off a significant amount of light rays uh, in the process of polarization. So I, in this case, would be significantly smaller. I could actually write, let's say, maybe uh, 40, 40 unit or something like that. This is the first thing that you need to understand. Whenever we do the polarization, you definitely lose a significant portion of the brightness of the original light source. So if you have a polarizer and if you don't have a polarizer, these two sources are not going to look the same. That's the first thing. Second thing is that this is also another polarizer, but because now we are using this polarizer onto an already polarized wave. You try to understand. This unpolarized light, this single vertical arrow represents a polarized light. And because now we are using the second polarizer on a polarizer light, we are simply calling it analyzer. It's just not a different generic name. They're just calling it analyzer to differentiate between the first polarizer and the second polarizer. You can also name them as polarizer one, polarizer two, doesn't matter. So let's say the intensity of this polarizer is to shesh kori tapar question nechi. Haat uthao, samoshana I'll give you the chance to ask questions, no big deal. So let's say the intensity of this light wave over here is given by I naught and that light ray over here for the first polarized light has an intensity of let's say A naught. And is now we have a second polarizer that has an angle with the original polarizing angle. So you can see over here, this, this phi is represented as the angle between the original polarized light and the second polarizer orientation. So the light that is gonna be coming out over here, let's say that light would be, uh, I'm gonna call it I, only I. So this was initial light I naught. So I'm naming this as having intensity of A naught. And let's say this light wave would be having, having an intensity of I and an amplitude of A. The way this polarizer will reduce the intensity of the incoming light rays. Now you might wonder that why isn't this cut off altogether? It is not cut off altogether when, the, when a single polarized light is passing through, the, uh, passing through a polarizer, it is not entirely cut off. It has a certain fraction of the wave that can pass through. How much fraction can pass through? That comes from the idea of uh, angle. The idea is that as long as these two polarizers be perfectly aligned, for example, let's say our first polarizer, actually, I could actually draw this figure with turn over here. Let me just draw this figure. Let's say this is the path of the light. So for example, let's say this is the path of the light coming out of the page. Let's say our polarizer one is aligned this way. This is the align uh, orientation for polarizer one. And within the same path, after the polarizer one, 
let's say I'm gonna place polarizer two within with this arrow orientation. So let's say this is a polarizer two, which we have placed in this orientation. So let's say if the angle between these two things is theta, here they have given phi, phi is also okay, no matter, doesn't matter. Then a small fraction of the intensity would be ultimately available on the output end. That intensity is given by the square of cos theta proportion between these two light sources. Why does this cos theta actually come from that exclusive def uh, 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 whole that, 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 that whole discussion is not uh, given in your syllabus. You are only increase the formula. And you just have to understand that this works by the quotient formula for one reason is that if the two polarizers were perfectly aligned with each other, for example, if the polarizer one If it so happens that our polarizer one alignment and our polarizer two alignment are perfectly same to each other, polarizer two are perfectly same to each other, in that case, all the light will be able to pass through. And if it so happens that I'm going to show you, show this to you through some YouTube video, that if we have this polarizer one and polarizer two, at uh, if we let's say if we start to tilt the polarizer two and slowly start to increase the angle more and more and more uh, it just so happens that when these two polarizers become perfectly perpendicular to each other for example like this when they have a 90 degree between them when the theta equals to 90 degree in that case the intensity becomes zero that's out of a practical uh, experience now and then if we start to rotate it further and let's say if i rotate it further and start to go for this orientation and eventually make it vertical once again, it means that if I, from the starting position, if I make it a 180 degree rotation full, then the intensity once again becomes completely like the original. So that behavior is that whenever you have zero degree, uh, you have uh, full uh, intensity passing through, at 90 degree, you have zero uh, passing through, and at 180 degree, you once again have full passing through in terms of magnitude that is, because we already have a uh, square over here. So, that actually follows the cosine ratio. So that's where the Malas's law comes by, is that the intensity is given by the cosine uh, square formula. That's, that's for the Malas's law. And before I start taking your questions, I'll definitely answer your question, just follow your horses. Let me just show you some example for the polarization of light. There is a very some, there's a pretty amazing uh, polar. Sir, my question was that can we write the term analyze in our like answer script in sure. CIE? Yes, you can. Okay, sir. Vertical light waves. Sir Richard Feynman, ki quantum ne kaat kar silona Richard Feynman. He had a lot of contribution, not exclusively quantum physics. Nope, apparently I'm not seeing the video that I'm looking for. Sir, up near history, better, sir. I don't want to browse back to one year back history.
I think it would be faster if you browse to your home, sir. Uh, I think you're wrong in this aspect. Sir, why is your name key, sir? I think this is the one. Or maybe I'm not just gay, I'm getting the actual video because the uh, rot. There, you can These search are, uh, through his you know, know, polarizing video. filters. And what they do is that they have a a particular direction in this material. There are polymers that are lined up in a particular direction and only allow electric fields to pass through that are aligned in that direction. Electric fields that are perpendicular to that direction get absorbed by the filter. And to demonstrate how this works, you can see already that it's, that it's a little bit dark. It looks like dark uh, colored sunglasses. Um, but it's more than just dark glass. It's um, if the two, if you put two polarizers together, and their polarization directions are lined up, then most of the light passes through. Whereas if you rotate them 90 degrees, you can cut out almost all of the light. I think by now my face should have disappeared which is not a bad thing. And then as we continue to rotate them, we're bringing the two transmission directions into alignment with each other again. And Polaroid, I believe, was the first um, company that, that produced polarized lenses. And if you have... Um, you can find out if your lenses are polarized or not by taking one lens off and then turning it perpendicular to the other one and if the image disappears then you know they're polarized lenses. We can do the same thing by just taking these um, and, 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 and putting it in front of, of this other and then rotating and I think you can see that at this point the image goes completely dark through that lens. Now we're back to being able to see through it again. And um, so these are polarized lenses. These are just dark lenses uh, that are not polarized. And you'll see that the image does not depend on orientation. And so that's one way to tell. The uh, polarized lenses um, are polarized in the vertical direction so that um, light that's reflected from the surface glare, for example, on a rainy day, um, will get cut out by the vertical polarization. We'll talk more about that later. That's polarization. Sir, was this the video you were looking for? Hey guys, so today uh, I kind of look a little funny and it's really messing my vision a little right now. But what I'm here to show you guys is the difference in having polarized glasses or lenses of any kind and not having any polarized. So looking through this eye, you know, with no filter or anything, 
it's really hard to see the fish there in front of me but with this one I can see right through the surface cut the glare cut all the reflections and I can see right down and see these schools of shad there's millions and millions of shad out here in front of me and I'm gonna kind of do my best here with this lens the extra one I popped out to show you the difference in having a polarized lens and not having a polarized lens so I'm gonna flip around show you what I'm talking about so you can already see just from looking at the surface tons of dead shad out here you can see some glimmers you can see some of these turning on their sides there's a lot of dying shad out here also so this is another little pointer I want to talk about you get into these shad schools and if you throw something real slow shiny a couple little flickers like this guy down here going crazy you know he's dying that's what a lot of these fish are going to go after they're going at these little dying fish they're going to sit right under the school shads and just wait for those shad to fall down easy meal right fish are lazy they don't want to work hard they want this uh meat shad all that just drop right in front of their face and scarf it down so here's the lens so without and this is with so you can see a little better you can see the millions and millions of shad that are out here right now so you can see the sun glare let's see there we go it's very minimal you can see the shad swim around they're schooling and then i take it away you can't see it so that's the difference somewhat makes sense yes sir it is awesome sir yes sir so no polarized polarized if you don't have polarized glasses you're missing a lot of fish out there you're not going to see the structure you're not going to see the rocks you're not going to see what you're doing out here and that's that's half the game if you can see it you can cast right to the fish you can do some sight casting so this is awesome sir yep sir, are all lenses like polarized no no polarized. no you have to you have to make them in a very specific mechanism Hey folks, Glenn May here with Bass Re Yep. Check this out. This is the difference wearing polarized sunglasses while fishing and not. See all the fish? Now look. Now do you see the fish? This is the bottom view of the lake. This is how the lake actually looks like on the surface. Pretty crazy, huh? But sir, I don't see any fish, sir. Well, maybe there are. color chilo. So that's pretty much it about the polarization part. Uh, you might have some uh, very few uh, MCQ questions about from this formula. That's pretty likely. So if you have that, uh, you can solve it by this very simple equation for the case of intensity. And that's pretty much it. Sir, how much do polarized sunglasses cost, sir? Google it. Have a look for yourself. Sir, do you have any? No, I don't have any. Oh, sorry, sir. No, it's okay. Okay, so this is the first worksheet for the waves chapter, uh, paper two I'm picking up for, to begin with. So these are for some pretty simple questions. I'm gonna show you uh, specifically the, I'm gonna try to show you the 
problems that is uh, important for you to learn to draw drawings can prove to be slightly difficult so i'm going to help you sort out the mechanism how you can draw the waves more easily for example if you have a look at this question number one for paper two structure <coughs> it says figure 2.1 shows the variation with distance x along the wave of its displacement d at a particular time so this is a frozen view of the wave at a particular time instant this is the vertical axis this is the horizontal axis the wave is a progressive wave having a period of uh, having a speed of 330 meters per second use figure 2.1 to determine the wavelength of the wave this is actually pretty simple uh, this horizontal axis is marked in meters so we just have to uh, be able to see one full cycle so i can see it very easily from the wave that the wavelength would be 0 0.6 meter i can see it hence calculate the frequency of the wave so that would be v equals to f lambda so you are asked to calculate f equals to v uh if it goes to v over lambda so you just place all the numbers and calculate the frequency so one mark over here two mark over here 12 3 and that's uh pretty easy have a look at the second part the question number b says a second wave that has the same frequency and speed try to understand a second wave that has the same frequency and speed has as the wave shown in figure 2.1 but has double the intensity Try to understand double the intensity. The phase difference between the two waves is 180 degree. These are two important information. It has double the intensity, and there is a phase difference of 180 degree. On the axis of figure 2.1, sketch a graph to show the variation with distance x of the displacement d of the second wave. Okay. So the first thing that I would like you to understand is that intensity is related to amplitude by a square proportion formula so i proportional to amplitude squared now you might wonder why am i talking about amplitude because on this graph we have displacement of the particle versus distance of the uh, on this on the medium so all these parts that you can see over here they are practically amplitudes of the wave so if you're trying to draw on the next wave we need to pinpoint the uh, points of amplitudes primarily for amplitudes to be able to draw the second wave that's the first thing the other information that is important that the question says it has the same frequency and speed. So if it has the same frequency and speed, that essentially means that it would have the same wavelength, which means the amount of wavelength that you see over here, the cycle length that you see over here, for your drawing, for you, the wave that you are trying to draw, that would also have the same wavelength. You are not going to have a different wavelength. So in this case, uh, 30 divisions complete one full cycle for your wave drawing. 30 divisions, 30 horizontal division should complete one full cycle. So basically you are trying to draw the same uh, wave shape in terms of spacing, but you gotta bring about two changes. What are those changes? First of all, the second wave should have doubled the intensity. Now, somehow to be able to draw on this figure, you have to convert the intensity information into amplitude information. That's what we're trying to get at. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, change this formula. So I'm gonna write A squared proportional to I so a will be proportional to root over of i if you wonder why am i doing this i'm bringing the intensity on the right hand side of the proportionality so that i can derive how the change of intensity is going to cause a change of amplitude so this would actually tell me that if the intensity becomes double how much should the amplitude become have a look intensity has a root over on it this equation this proportionality tells me that if the, when the intensity of a certain wave becomes double the amplitude should become this do you understand this part no sir yes okay you so have a look okay yes sir Oh, sir. So basically, you're saying that if i becomes 2i, a becomes root over 2, 2a. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay, sir. Alternately, it could be also like that if i becomes 3i, uh, a root should become root over 3. Exactly. So, how the change of i is causing the change of amplitude, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, this would mean that the new amplitude that I'm trying to draw should be root over two times the amplitude shown over here. So, calculate in your calculator, you should see that root over two is about 1.4, and the amplitude of these waves are given as five vertical divisions. So, 
uh, if you multiply these two, how much do you, how many divisions do you get? Five into root two, how much do you get? Seven point one. 7.1 so i think 7 is good enough for our purpose for our requirement so uh, 7 divisions would be the 7 divisions would be the required uh, vertical divisions for the new wave and then the next change that we have to bring about in our drawing is the phase change the question says that the new wave that we are trying to draw has a phase angle difference of 180 degree now try to remember what does 180 degree phase difference actually mean if you have a given wave that looks like this a 180 degree phase shift means all the crests and the troughs will be 180 degree or half lambda apart, half lambda shifted in one direction. So uh, try to have a look, try to understand what I'm saying. Let's say you have a wave of this shape. Remember this information that time period is relevant for one lambda, which is relevant for 360 degree phase difference, which is also relevant to four A times the particle movement distance. Now, 180 degree phase difference would basically means uh, amount of lambda change of lambda by two. This would mean that if I'm trying to draw a wave on the same axis that has 180 degree phase shift, all of the relevant points needs to be moved by lambda by two. So what does it mean? For example, have a look. This is a wave. For example, let's say, uh, let me use blue. Let's say this is our given wave. And this much is one lambda. So half of this length is lambda by two. I might actually use the grid of this whole, uh, whole whiteboard so to make it easier to understand. Just let me just erase this thing. Hold up. So let's say like this. And like this. So let's say. So let's say this is a given wave. So what I need to observe is that this much is one lambda <coughs> spacing. So lambda by two, this much spacing. So if we're trying to make a 180 degree phase shift, we need to move all the relevant points by lambda by two. So if I shift, have a look, try to understand. If I shift this point by lambda by two, this point goes here. If I shift this one by lambda by two, this point goes here. So this would be my starting point. This would be my next crest. Same goes for the trough. This would be lambda by two spaced somewhere over. So this point would come over here. This point would come over there. And this point would come over there. Basically, I'm shifting the wave by one degree. Now, you might wonder that at the difficult code of the one degree phase shift actually means that all the crest becomes troughs and the troughs become crest. That's perfectly all right. That's totally true. Because one degree phase shift basically means that the, all the things will simply get inverted. But the reason I'm trying to show you in terms of this uh, shift, because if you are ever trying to do it for, let's say, a 30 degree phase shift, or maybe a 60 degree phase shift, or maybe a 90 degree phase shift, then how you are going to do that? That's why I'm trying to show you this way. So this actually gives me all the uh, individual points. So the points that I have already located, I'm going to try to draw the waves through those points. So I'm, I, have to, I have located this point, this one, this one, this one, this one. And this one. So if I, try, I just try to complete the wave through these wave exclusively, these points exclusively, this is how my new wave is going to look like, provided I'm drawing with the same amplitude. And I can pretty much complete continue this wave in the logical order to make it start from the beginning. So Sir, why did you use that broken line or dotted line? To represent that... which point is shifted where. Oh, okay, sir. You don't have to draw that. I'm just trying to make sense. So uh, in this case, the red and the blue line has one degree phase shift, but they all have, both have the same amplitude. That was not the requirement for our case. For our scenario, the requirement was that we have to have uh, amplitude of, new amplitude should be seven divisions. So that new wave should look somewhat like this. So I'm going to show you how, if I was doing this draw graph, how I would be doing this. Uh, this crest is over here. So the other wave trough should be right below it but having an amplitude of seven divisions. I might actually go right over here. This would be one of my point. This would be one of my point of case. This would be one of my point as well. And right above this one, I should have at seven divisions exactly over here should be another point. So I'm actually 
labeling all the points of crests and the x is cross sir it says uh, like double the intensity right sir so will it be like the same amplitude sir i'm not drawing same amplitude am i oh okay sir sir now have a look how many how, how how big am i making the amplitude go the given amplitude is five divisions vertical divisions and how how many divisions do you see over here from the equilibrium so seven sir that is coming from root over two multiplied by five that gives you seven okay sir approximately so that's how uh, i would define all the points and this is gonna be somewhere over here this is right over here and this one goes up right over here this is over here so now all that you have to do is you have to join these points in a smooth curve drawing a smooth curve can prove to be difficult for some points one of the one of the uh, uh what can i say one of the very uh, important uh, advice that i can give you that whenever you're trying to draw a smooth curve uh, try to look for the next two points it's a difficult task but that's uh, in my opinion is uh, how you can develop the skill that you look out for the next two points that where you are trying to go so not exactly on the next one so for example if we are only looking at this point coming from this point it is likely that we are going to uh, complete a, a straight line but if you if you are looking at this point and that point both of them you would know that i have to make a bend over here so if you are looking at both of this point the most likely scenario is that you are going to make a curve over here like that and then you are going to make a curve over here like that and it goes on like that and this is not a very good curve but somewhat like this uh, convenient way i should not convenient i should say that the safe way the safest of the ways is uh, to score full marks in this kind of graph drawing is that all the points that you have uh, that you have specified to draw your own graph mark them by a dot circle so just mark all those points by a dot circle so that the examiner would know that you knew precisely what you are doing <laughs> and they would appreciate that effort for you because you're gonna mark the points anyway so mark them by dot and circle and then try to draw the best curve as you can the benefit of marking those points the dot circle is that you are specifying the exclusive points by which you are trying to draw your graph that way even if your graph is not as smooth as it is supposed to be or not doesn't pass through at all through all the points that it should have passed through examiner would still know that you knew the basic pretty well and you did your homework and you knew how to draw this so the uh, lacking mean your uh, smoothness of your curve can be disregarded and you can might still score full marks for those questions so but sir they don't know whether you gave homework to us or not good point good point any any, any further question लॉन्ग ट्यूब फिल Uh, the, the tap is filled with water a tiny pop is sounded above the top of the tube as the water is allowed to run out of the tube as shown in figure 6.1 so we have tiny pop of 512 hertz important information we can need that so i'm going to underline this information and this figure clearly shows us that the difference between the first resonant depth and the second resonant depth is 32.4 so if you recall from your earlier uh, discussion that uh, this much gap represents how much in terms of lambda you can see over here this is how much this shape represents how much of lambda for a stationary wave anyone sir the camera was you okay i'll help you this wave is traveling vertically so uh, in this case the stationary wave might actually look It's difficult for me to draw in this way, but okay, I'll try. The stationary wave might actually look somewhat like this, and if I draw both the cycles with nodes and antinodes, this is how it should 
look like oops i'm not drawing it perfectly but what i'm trying to show you is, is that this much is one loop this is one loop and this is one loop so how much do you see over here in terms of lambda Tinta. nope okay i'll help you remember two and a half sir no I, I'm asking you. I'm asking you that within this much length, how much of lambda do you see? Oh, sir, a half. Oh, half. No, you don't see half. One foot. That's the correct response, but pretty late, don't you think? I'll help you uh, so, uh, do this. Uh, this sir, was it supposed to be a longitude wave, sir? It is a longitudinal wave, but for the sake of simplicity, it is drawn to be transverse wave because it's easy, that's easy. Oh, to sir. Give me a large figure. Okay. Okay, I can work with this. This is nice. Sure. Use the canvas with black, sir. Break, ask the same. Okay, sir. Let's say this is the most likely uh, state of the vertical stationary waves that we possibly get over here. So this is actually a, 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 a normal figure. So what I wanted to see that how much this part within the structure, if I divide this whole figure into multiple parts, should represent in terms of lambda. So what you should recall that two of these loops make one lambda. So <clears throat> this much is one lambda. Sorry, not this much, my bad. This much is one lambda. So how much would this shape, this much mean in terms of lambda? A part two, one foot one foot mean but practically there is a bit of an error over here which you call uh, uh, end error <laughs> so a to go mother actually lambda by four so if i call this one l1 l1 plus e is totally lambda by four and over here we have the second resonant length for the second resonant length the figure is going to look somewhat like this so i might actually give points over here because i want to draw somewhat like this. <clears throat> so over here, we have actually from here through here, we have three lambda by four. And if we call this much length L2, L2 plus the end error together produce this thing. So this much gap precisely gives us lambda by two. Like the difference between the two resonant lengths, first two resonant lengths gives us lambda by two, which in this case is equal to 32.4 centimeter. So that's pretty much the very basic requirement of uh, calculation that you have to understand from here. 
the question says a loud sound is first heard when the water level is from the system one then again when the water level is from the system one two on the system one let's take the stationary produce the on the tube on okay on figure 6.2, sketch the form of the station wave setup in the tube. So you are expected to draw this figure. Now, to draw this figure conveniently, what is recommend that if you found draw, give a dot over here, give a dot halfway over here, and then you make this figure as best as you can for the spacing. Mark with the letter N the position of the of any nodes in the stationary wave. So node is produced over here. The question says any. Uh, so, and then they have used plural as well. So they are expecting all the nodes. So I'm going to write over here and, 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 and this is only for figure 6.2. So no need to bother to draw on figure 6.1. Then it says the frequency of the fluid tuning fork is 512 hertz and the difference in the height of the water level for the two positions where a loud sound is heard is 32.4 centimeter. Obviously they're going to ask us to find the speed of the sound wave. So in this case, we're going to write lambda by two equals to 32.4 centimeter. Therefore, lambda equals to 64.8 centimeter. Therefore, V equals to F lambda, which gives you 512 multiplied by 0 0.648. Whatever that gives you is the speed of sound for this medium. That's where pretty much it. Calculation to starting where would you answer? I calculated the lambda value from here. Then to calculate the speed of the sound, I use V equals to F lambda. Sir, did you like, oh, like you didn't like measure it, like sir? No, I didn't measure anything. I just I took the value from the figure. So sir, in the top we have one lambda by four and we try to convert that to the second, the rest of the part in our diagram and try to find out the position of the nodes. If I'm, am I correct sir? Like, a, like the distance. Oh, I'm sorry. So did I get it right? Uh, I didn't understand, understand you properly. Could you please say the question again? Like I'm trying to like uh, validate that I got it right. Uh, so what, basically, what did you get? First of all, sir, we uh, we we know that because there is this lambda by four, we uh, we take this data and uh, and we have drawn on that uh, this that the, we have another node with this data. So we uh, we can say that this in lambda by two is this uh, is this length. Yes. So now we can uh, with this data we can find that was the total length over here. We don't need the need to find out the total length over here because that was not a requirement for the question. The question was asking us to calculate the speed of the sound in the tube. So uh, speed of the sound, to calculate the speed of the sound, you require the value of frequency of the sound and the uh, lambda of the sound. So all that we need is to find the total length, length of the lambda. That's sir, we... Huh? And ball, okay. I... So, but sir, we don't know the like, uh, speed of the sound. Uh, uh, but sir, we don't know the frequency, sir. Yes, we do. Read the question. Oh, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, we have the frequency. Okay, sir. Okay, now I get it. Beautiful. Sir, the C number question have all of Munai. Sir, I'm going to take a class for the company to please take it in the charge. Okay. I'm going to take a class. Okay. C number will see the length of the column in the air column in phase 6.1 is 15.7 centimeter. So now they're saying that this length of the column is 15.7 centimeter. Suggest so where the antinode of the stationary wave produced in the tube in figure 6.1 is likely to be found. So where the antinode of the stationary wave produced in the tube in figure 6.1 is likely to be found. Now try to understand this part. They've specified that the first resonant length is 15.7. So what they are meaning is this L1, so from the edge of the tube to the first resonant length, this much is 15.7. Now try to understand, lambda by two was 32.4. From this part, you can essentially see that lambda by four, she's supposed to be how much? Half of that. So that is supposed to be 16.2 centimeter, right? You don't have to write this, but do you see it already? 
the reason I'm trying to get you this number is because from this point, where is the node of this resonance position, the lambda i4 length should be from this point, 16.2 centimeter above, where the length of the tube is only 15.7 centimeter. So the antinode should be above the edge of the uh, glass tube. And the question says that suggest, the, suggest where the antinode the stationary wave producing the tube fifth super one is likely to be found there is two mark in it so you have to show some calculation to uh to validate your claim if i was answering this question i'm going to write that uh, lambda by four equals to 32.4 divided by two equals to 16.2 centimeter so then i'm i would write that and uh 16.2 minus 15.7 equals to how much? 0 0.5, so minus 0 0.5 centimeter. So this would mean that <coughs> the total lambda by four length equals to 16.2 centimeter. The length of the air, air tube for the first resonance is 15.7 as the question says. So the antinode position, which is exactly at the center of the uh, tuning fork, this antinode position should be found this much above the glass tube. And how much is that distance? That is the difference of 16.2 and 15.7. So I would show this calculation, this two part of calculation, then I'd write that the antinode is located 0 0.5 centimeter above the glass tube. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is another uh, interesting question. Question number three, if you have a look over here. Light reflected on the surface of a smooth water may be described as polarized transverse wave by reference to the direction of the propagation of energy. Explain what is meant by a transverse wave. We just give the definition over here and what is meant by polarization. The definition of polarization uh, in very simple words or the, as the main key phrase can be found for the mark scheme of this question. So I'm gonna have a look at it and give you some uh, insight for why that is correct. This is question number three. Here is a mark scheme. Vibrations in one direction. So this one word is the main key part that the examiners are looking for. Vibration is one direction, or you can write vibration of the light waves are in one direction, or a single a single direction. Single is also okay. And normal to the direction of the propagation is optional. You can write this, not write this, or only writing this is going to not score with the mark. You have to specify this thing. If you have a look over here for the examiner's report, have a look. <laughs> it says that candidates did not explain that for transverse wave, the vibrations are in any direction in a plane normal to the direction of the propagation. Many wrote about one direction. For polarization, the most common answer was that oscillations are in one plane rather than in one direction uh, in a plane normal to the direction of the propagation. What does it mean? Oh, what's that? You cannot write that for polarization vibrations are in one plane. Mentioning plane over here would be wrong. You have to write vibrations are in one direction. That's the uh, takeaway from this paragraph. I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate what this means. It's important for you to understand. Have a look. If the light ray goes in this direction, if the light ray goes in this direction, a normal plane on this direction can be considered, let's say if I draw a rectangular plane, let's say somewhat like this. This is a normal plane. Let's say this is the point which the light is going through. For an unpolarized light ray, the vibration of the particles could be anywhere on this plane. That's the property of an unpolarized light. light. Whereas the polarized light should have only one specific direction of vibration. So unpolarized light, 
can have multiple different directions in one perpendicular plane that is perpendicular with the direction of the light. So this plane is perpendicular with the direction of the light and the vibration can possibly in, in many directions. Whereas the polarized light has its vibration exclusively in one direction. So kids who actually wrote for this answer that the vibration of the, of the particles are limited to one plane, you did not score the mark because having it defined in one plane is basically defined by the definition of transverse wave. Transverse wave says that the particle vibration should be perpendicular to the direction of the wave propagation. Whereas polarization means that the vibrations of the particles or vibration of the wave is specified in only one direction, <coughs> not in many other direction in a perpendicular plane. Hang, fine, bolo. Sir, uh, actor polarizer take care, actor polarizer, Johan, uh, wave jet, Johan, like, can they sustain her to the journal like winner, right? Like, no, 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 you don't need that. That's it. Okay, <clears throat> before I get into this question, let me just show you some cool video to give you some idea. Actually, it's a delay, Asha Kotha. The salt figures. <laughs> yep. Have a look at this thing and then I'm going to explain. Why do you think this shape is formed? <clears throat> Get some idea. Idea, sir. Think. Try. Persevere. You are allowed to be wrong, but just think that we had sprinkled salt onto this black piece of uh, plate, and then we are vibrating it at this underneath this screw. There is a mechanical uh, vibrator which is controlled. Actually, it's a solenoid vibrator. <laughs> that is controlled by a signal generator from the outer source. So these two wires are feeding a current of 345 hertz. So this plate is now vibrated at 345 hertz. And within this vibration, we have this kind of a shape produced. What do you, what can you think about it? I mean, sir. Yes. <clears throat> sir, can you a destructive but constructive interference of the constructive with any mask and a solid glass to set and destructive on a bad head. You said it just the other way around. Try to think of it. <laughs> the vibrations are produced from the center of the screw. Try to think about it. The vibrations are going to be uh, spread out. I mean, this is very much like a vibrating plane. So the vibrations are sent out circularly outwards <laughs> and they will be bouncing off this edge and coming back. So because this plate is not circular, it is rectangular. So they'll be bouncing back at some very specific pattern. Locations where we have nodes, think about it. Nodes are the points where the stationary wave particles have zero amplitude, right? Which means they don't move. Think about it. Nodes yes, are sir. the positions where the particles yes, do sir. not move. 
So whenever we have this shape, this actually means that locations where we have anti node, the particles are supposed to move very vigorously, and that should definitely move them. That happens to be places where salt lines are not seen. For example, this line that you see over here, this part represents a location of a node where the vibration of the metal plate is almost zero. And because of that, the salt particles are able to stay undisturbed, almost undisturbed, over here. but for within this region, within this region, we have very large vibrations. So the salt particles are incapable to stay there. So this is the pattern that we were getting at 345 Hertz. So what I can say is that from this point, this is definitely an antinode point. This is the start of a vibration. From here to here, this much part is lambda by four, antinode to node. Then from here to here is a node through sure. antinode. And then there should be another node over here because we can see resting uh, salt particles over here. The salt particles are not, uh, if I play, have a look that many of the salt particles are practically So, sir, uh, the more the uh, frequency increases, the reflect the number of reflected waves uh, and uh, nodes increases. Therefore, we get this awesome looking pattern. Yep. And, sir, the shape of the surface plays a very good role as well. Have a look because at this one. And when it goes, that fits very nice. So why don't we just take it? Hello, hello. So have a look at this one to how this driver, and it's sitting in a tub to catch the sand as it comes off the plates. This is a mechanical vibrator. I can adjust the frequency, frequency and get different patterns. Have different shapes. Changing the position of the motion that goes on the table. Now we've also made the same type of patterns on top of a bucket simply by yelling at it. Hello! <laughs> so this is basically a piece of plastic and there are some very dry and light sand particles and he's just screaming over here and his voice frequency is basically going to produce a stationary wave over here. Hello! Oh! 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 Now there So did you see that? Yes sir. This is yes, basically sir. Yes, sir. we can actually do this on our own like yeah yeah definitely, definitely with high frequency you can definitely do that and this is basically showing the production of the vibration wave and the way uh, uh, some people uh, allegedly can actually break glass by their uh, vocal cord song or some uh, opera song uh, stuff is that whenever they match the vibration frequency of a certain glass structure or metal structure for example and they can do it at a such high amplitude that the bending happens so high that it eventually breaks off. So uh, even bulletproof grasses break off like that. Yeah, there is actually one specific video so from the Lasix chapter, Lasix YouTube channel. I'm gonna share the link to you. Uh, that has a pretty nice explanation for the station stationary wave how the how it can actually bear break glass. Uh, that's also pretty interesting. I mean, super interesting. The reason I'm trying to show I try to show you all of these videos is to get you an idea for what is happening over here. If we have a look at this figure, we have a tube, a glass tube closed at one end has fine dust sprinkled along its length. So initially we had uh, fine dust all over the length. A sound source is placed near the open end of the tube as shown in figure 5.1. So we have the sound source over here, just 
sending sound through here. The frequency of the sound wave is emitted by the source is varied and at one frequency, the dust forms small heaps in the tube. So we have some heaps of sound of dust over it. Now, what do you think the heap location, the dust heap location represent? Do, does this represent a node position or an anti-node position? What do you think? Anti-node. Anti-node, sir. Anti-node. Okay. Anti-node are the positions where the air particles are vibrating the most. Nodes are the position where and the air particles are vibrating the least. Dust no, particles and... should get settled where? At the most disturbing position or the least disturbing position? Least disturbing. So, so sir, the... this dust heap is a node because here the least vibration is occurring. Precisely. So you can see over here, this should be a node, right? You can see a heap. Yes, sir. Heap that is. And this one should be what? Also another node. This one should also be node. The reason no dust is for no dust accumulation happened over in this region or over in this region because here we have large amount of this uh, amplitude for the air particles. So between these two heaps, somewhere over here, we can say there is an antenna position for the air particles. There is an antenna position for the air particles. Does this idea make sense? The, yes. the dust particle accumulation depends upon where the disturbance is. If you have very high disturbance in the air, you have almost no dust particles at there at those positions. Locations where the dust particles, where the air particles are pretty stationary, not bothering the dust particles. That's where the dust particles are going to get accumulated. It's basically like uh, sweeping or jharudar moto. The air particles are moving pretty fast at that node, so they are basically displacing all the dust particles to the closest node position where they are not vibrating as much. So if you understand this part, so have a look over here. So let's say from this position. To this position, the figure tells us this much is 39 centimeter. In terms of lambda, how much this length should be? Have a look. This is a node, another node, another node, another node, another node, another node. So how many loops do you have? Pasta. I'm drawing. Within this length, label length, you have five loops. Five loops means what? Five lambda by two, right? That much is equal to 39.0 centimeter. So in this case, how much does the lambda become? Can you calculate and tell me? Someone? 78 by five. That is decimal? 15.6. 15 <laughs> 15.6. Beautiful. A observation of Bushagas Shobar. J heap location gula hoche node position. Amra Ipraj video gula de la J position gula tama the J alignment gula tama the dust particular accumulate hoche. Those are the locations where there are node alignments. And the locations where there are no dust particles or salt particles, those are the parts represented, the antinode locations. In between the two accumulated parts, there are antinodes. Uh, so that's something of that sort. The question says over here, explain for, for, uh, by reference to the properties of stationary, why heaps of dust are formed. So you just have to say the process by which uh, stationary wave happen. And you have to specify for this example that <coughs> locations where antinodes are formed, the air particles have a high amplitude. So dust particles are moved from there, uh, or dust particles cannot accumulate there. And, and in the node positions, the air molecules have zero amplitude around that region, the dust particles can accumulate. So all the heaps represent the nodes and all the uh, midpoints between two heap location represents the anti-node. So can a good highlight. I'm going to take a mask in the guy. The mask in the region is like a kicky point. They highlight course. So have a look over here. This is question number three B. So take a look at displacement of anti-nodes where there are no heaps wave has maximum amplitude or vibration at displacement or nodes. <coughs> At distant nodes where there are heaps, amplitude of vibration is zero minimum. Dust is pushed or settled at distant nodes. So these are the very basic uh, part that the examiners are going to look for in terms of vibration, in terms of heap generation. If you have a look for the uh, examiner's report, frequently, candidates wrote at length about the formation of a stationary wave rather than its properties. So you have to understand that. Many people fill it up with literature, maybe logical lit literature about stationary waves, uh, important points, but not pinpointing the part that the examiners are looking for. 
It appeared that from a significant portion of answers, some candidates had not seen the effect demonstrated and were quite unaware of the fact that the dust would settle at the nodes. So now that you have observed it through some YouTube videos that it actually, how does it happen? I hope you wouldn't have this problem. Bujaka say question ka? Yes, sir. Any question so far? Sir. Bala. I video ta sir to upload kore di and I had trouble keeping up with certain things. Achha, take us. Sir, arita jini sir. Bala. <coughs> Sir, I'm at the 22nd November physical exams as a school, sir. Sir, your momentum chapter take to Larek Bar Bujai did the barb and should do it a take to problem, sir. Like a uh, clear but uh, a difficult question will on a difficult to lesser parina. I'll make them show. I told them to the political data who said again, I say electricity. Electricity to sir easy to learn, sir. It's not a sir. Eh? Cash of the question in the name. পরীক্ষা <laughs> 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 Uh, sir, I'm going to physically put it in a sir. You should not for the sake of your own good result, that's not a good thing. But I get the point. Yeah, we all think about it, but we are we are encouraged not to talk about it. Ah, uh, never mind. अच्छा एक है ना सिंपल किसी क्वेश्चन है से आमी एक टक क्वेश्चन देखा है आशिक लास्ट जस्ट कोई आशिक तो ना प्रश्न आना भी ऐसे से एक है ना पंजीकरण करो अच्छा एक क्वेश्चन तो First question five The variation with time t of the displacement of, of x point. The variation with time t of the displacement of x point of a transverse of t1 is shown in figure t for 5.1. So we have a certain wave shown over here. But if to displacement and duration of travel of wave energy is then what is meant by transverse wave? So you basically have to elaborate the definition of transverse wave. That's pretty much it. In B number, it says. A second transverse wave T2 amplitude A has the same waveform as T1 but lags behind T1 by phase angle of 60 degree. The two waves T1 and T2 pass through the same point. On figure 5.1, draw the variation with time T1, T, the distance X of the point wave in T2. Now, one thing you should remember, I was actually I was incapable to explain why that is. I actually forgot. I need to study it once again. Is that one thing that you should remember that lagging waves should be drawn on the right of the leading wave so leading waves should have should be on the left and the lagging wave should be on the right what i mean because we are trying to draw a lagging wave of this waveform all the necessary relevant points crest equilibrium trough they have to be moved to the right and how much should we move them? That's the important bit. Have a look over here. The question is asking us that the second wave should have a phase angle, should lag behind by a phase angle of how much? 60 degree. Now, 60 degree shift should mean how many horizontal divisions for this figure? 60 degree phase angle should mean how many horizontal divisions for this figure? Let's, uh, let's calculate it out. Remember this thing, that one lambda or one time period perfectly meant how many degrees 360 degrees right so yes. if you are trying to get 60 degrees you are trying to shift it by time period one sixth of time period i'm going for time period over here because this axis is time so we are dealing with time period over here so have a look how many divisions horizontal divisions make one full time period for this for this wave three uh, seconds no no so small divisions how many divisions 30 divisions 30 horizontal divisions make one time period. Do you see that? Yes, sir. So in this case, T equals to 30 division, 30 division. So T by six should be equals to how much? Five division? 180. No, 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 no. T by six. 
not but one thirty line. by six, the uh, thirty five by division. six, five division. It means that now we have to shift the entire wave five division to the right. Entire wave. So what is the easier way to do this thing? Let me draw this for you. I'm going to use red. So let's say I'm going to shift this point over here. I'm going to give a circle dot. This point over here, circle dot. This point right over here, circle dot. Sir, five division taken of the hyperbola. Uh, sixty division for this figure represents thirty division. To make a shift of sixty degree, I have to <clears throat> make it one sixth. I mean, oh, yeah, the other uh, in this case, 60 degree represents 30 division, right? So, like one quarter represent kore, or 60 degree quarter to represent kore. Calculate kore dako. Ultimately, in five division, Baba. Good show. Okay, sir. <coughs> so, I'm shifting all the points over here. You can actually shift all the points as you want, or you can just shift a couple of points, no big deal. But ultimately, your wave should be shifted like this. Sir. Yes. Sir, the crest that you the path division like sa shamne ni, our trough gula path division shamne ni. That person should do graph ta ki. Talo hobe, but she gets to my graph ta smooth coat to cost to hit a pare. But to me, you the a point gula define corner, that to my drawing points be sure that smooth out put the cost to come hobe. But to me, the a can take a position to smoothly act the other difficult. Did I mask at a point take a cut easier than a. Sir, but so only one extra mile like with the calculation good. Well, you have plenty of marks for this question, to be honest. Have a look how much marks do you have for this drawing? You have a total of total marks, two marks. So you have 120 seconds. Sir, marks what is it? Sir, 120 seconds is a good for a question. Good on a tough way, sir. Well. <laughs> if you keep on practicing slowly, this drawing should come natural. For example, if I'm going to dot define color, so I have an RTC. Now, I'm a right pattern, is the surface report. Column pencil, who let a color chill. It's not impossible to save time, you just have to get good at it over time. Butchiko, sir, shading at a G, sir, shading gender at a junior K waves for a chill and several levels, sir. <coughs> And then, sir, I'm going to paint the budget chillam, sir. The pain was real. <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit of a challenge to begin with, but you get accustomed to it. But that's the new wave that you are. This is the new wave that you're supposed to try. And do not forget to label this because you are supposed to draw a wave T2. So label the T2. That's pretty much it that I want to pause today's class. Inshallah, Mongol Badi Nawar Dakha, we have a lecture to put up with it. See, I'll show you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Well, awesome.